On today's World Insight, an epidemic of irrational fear over the coronavirus outbreak. Why do races slurs in a time of crisis? And a digital shift in the global economy despite uncertainty. Executives from a Russian fund in Alibaba talk about strategy. Uh, we believe that there is a new development paradigm that's really emerged uh, thanks to uh, digital uh, technology. Here's our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight coming to you live from Beijing. I'm Tian Wei. We begin with the coronavirus outbreak in China. The nation's total number of confirmed cases is now over 28,000, with 564 deaths as of Thursday. And there are more than 24,000 suspected cases already. And the numbers, well, the coronavirus has brought with it reports of racial profiling and xenophobia against Chinese and even Asians in different parts of the world. Let's take a look at this. I guess it's really upsetting um, and it feels hurtful that people see me as a threat. Heidi Chow was on a train in London last week with her husband and children when she noticed a man leave the empty carriage they were on to move to another one. But because I look Chinese or from East Asia, therefore I must have the coronavirus. And um, yeah, so it's quite hurtful to think that people are thinking that of me when I go into a room or when I go into a, onto public transport. She says the same thing has happened to her a number of times in the past few weeks, with people trying to avoid her in public spaces. The risk of me getting, having coronavirus is the same as any other non-Chinese person um, in London or in the UK because I haven't been to China in the last two weeks. In fact, I've, never, I've only been to China probably a, a, for a day trip 25 years ago. As international concern over the coronavirus grows, it's fueling reports of discrimination against Chinese people, including here in Europe. It's led the UN to speak out on the issue, saying no amount of fear can excuse hatred. The UK government has also urged people to avoid any hysteria. The rejection that this whole house demonstrates to any racism, and insensitivity towards the Chinese community here or indeed uh, visitors um, here of Chinese origin uh, because that will not help us tackle this disease. Some members of the UK's Chinese community say they've witnessed a rise in racist behaviour recently that's coincided with the spread of this outbreak. But many also say this isn't anything new. It seems dealing with racism has become a normal part of life for some East Asians, even those who were born and raised in this country. For 20 years, Dr. Diana Ye has been studying the history of Chinese people on these shores. She says the coronavirus has been racialized as something specifically linked to China. I think we've seen this time and time again throughout history. Um, there's always been a kind of latent racism, I would say, against the Chinese in Britain as um, globally, um, with yellow peril from the 19th century um, straight up to, you know, we can think about SARS 2003. Social media is also playing a role in France and other parts of Europe where cases of racism have been reported. The hashtag I'm not a virus has led to shows of support for victims of sinophobia. I am not a virus. That is the slogan and hashtag circling around the world. For more about this on these xenophobia listedly, we have witnessed that together with the coronavirus, we are joined in Berlin. Dr. Li Yayu, political neuroscientist. She is with Columbia University and she is now living in Berlin. And in Washington, D.C., we are joined by Professor Christopher Chambers, professor of journalism from Georgetown University. Now, now, to both of you, I have to say, xenophobia is not something new because you've been working in journalism and you've been working in the uh, scientific circle as well. So you know what it is all about. But how would you see the latest round of xenophobia? It seems that China now, or Chinese, is equal to a coronavirus. Isn't that a very scare, scareful? thought if you look at the reality these days, of Professor Chambers? Well, it, it is nothing new, this kind of racism and this kind of xenophobia. 
I think what is new is that um, in the past the United States and European powers have felt uh, superior to China. Now China is a major world power economically, militarily, et cetera, et cetera. So that increases the anxiety uh, of, 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 of these, uh, uh, of, of these you know, um, European and, and, and American governments and, and societies. Um, you also have a great interdependence of economies and many, many Chinese uh, stu excuse me, students who are uh, studying abroad in the United States and in Europe. So that's, that's the, cha the game changer right there. Mm, it is the game changer. China, of course, is more visible. The Chinese are everywhere in the world. Uh, Li Ya, you know that very well because you are living now in Berlin. You earlier have been associated with Columbia University. So you also been interviewed by German media about this. So what is your take? Is that a very special take compared to Professor Chambers? Well, I come from two perspectives. One is as a researcher studying the political brain, the brain, uh, brains that we all have across cultures, racism that we all have in our brains across cultures. And then I come at it from a very personal level, which is I am German Chinese. I am a German Huaren. So I get to experience it on both levels. Um, so I can tell you the racism is real. Um, it is felt in Germany, um, especially I think the media, the press, should have a special responsibility in a liberal democracy such as Germany to protect its minorities um, and not to gang up on one minority. But then as a scientist I also have to tell you that unfortunately from an evolutionary perspective we all have racist brains. Um, so you can see exclusion happening not only in Germany but also in other countries and even within China we can see exclusion mm. happening towards Hubei people, towards Wuhan people. Mm -hmm. So this is a moment where we all need to think how do we want our societies to look like? How much does discrimination matter to us in the 21st century? Yes, indeed. And finally I should say mm. racism towards Chinese is some... Go ahead. Racism towards Chinese is something that is often denied. So Chinese, Chinese are often um, discriminated against in a very subtle way. Um, namely, in a, a we are uh, de uh, dehumanized as machines. So Asians, just as Jews, are often seen as very competent, uh, uber-efficient, but lacking human warmth, human individu individuality, human creativity. We have to prove ourselves doubly so that we are human. All and right. so this is why this virus outbreak is so devastating, because we are, again, uh, equated to a virus, to something so impersonal. And the research shows, finally, uh, Tianwei, the research shows that the outcome of this subtle dehumanization towards Chinese and Asians is aggression and violence. So the consequences are real, they're dangerous, and we need to fight them. Right. It's a beautiful answer you just given. Let's take a look at the issue by layers. First of all, this is an epidemic in China. It is not yet an outbreak in other parts of the world. So why people are so scared and so fearful as if the coronavirus is around them on a daily basis, as if there will be hundreds and thousands of people around them already uh, sacrifice their life as a result. Uh, uh, Professor Chambers, how much misinformation, in fact, is involved here? And how much fear is being created or geared up as a result of ignorance, first of all? Well, it's, it's, it's the fault of, of, say, in the United States, the American media and political leaders to face up to this kind of, uh, of racism and misinformation. Because an aspect of, say, the racist brain is not admitting, you know, not wanting to look in the mirror at yourself. <coughs> Excuse me. Because if you look at the United States, we have had a flu epidemic here since October 1st, and the media does not report on it. 10,000 people, over 10,000 Americans, have died between October and January. Five million cases of our influenza A and B have been reported mm. since October 1st of 1999. Children, elderly, have died. 60,000 people have been hospitalized. I, was, I contracted uh, our influenza B along with my wife and other members of my family. But you don't see the American media or political leaders 
talking about that. And many times when Chinese Americans contract the flu or even a cold, the one that's devastated the United States since the autumn, people think it's coronavirus. Well, well that's ridiculous. Mm. So there was a failure of the American media to educate people. There was a failure of our political leaders to um, unleash the information that our own uh, Centers for Disease Control have over our own domestic flu, which is far more deadly than what's going on in China right now. Uh, Mr. Chambers, if I could just uh, follow up. Now, it is a fine balance as to you do not want to have overreactions to scare people. Many believe now the current administration has been having some overreactions toward the coronavirus as the numbers of uh, the, the uh, infected is not that much in the U.S. at least. Uh, however, on the other hand, you do not want to have any chance for the danger of your people. That is just for sure. So uh, the authority also face a fine balance, I guess, the experience, courage, and information. Knowledge here plays a big part. Uh, that's one thing. But on the other hand, how is that related now to the long-term uh, way people look at diseases. Remember H1N1, Latino Americans were being criticized as if they were the virus, as, as if they were the source of the virus. And remember Ebola? African Americans or Africans in different parts of the world uh, have to face up to these kinds of xenophobia as well. So it seems that there is an evolution of this existing xenophobia uh, popping up at times when virus is going around, it is a companion of the virus. This is the moral virus we're having right now, which is even probably more dangerous than the coronavirus itself. Uh, Professor Chambers, quick response. Yes, well, that, that's always been the case in human history. I mean, even the, the uh, bubolic plague was thought of as a, a scourge from God because uh, Europeans have been interacting too much with uh, people from uh, Central Asia and, 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 and East Asia. So, I mean, it, this is nothing new. I mean, this is, this is something that goes hand in hand with uh, infections, and they create the situation where, where these infections can become pandemics mm -hmm. because people are afraid to seek medical help. Mm. Leah, how do you see that? I mean, this thing has been going on and on and on, even though we are now 2020, the year 2020. Yes, absolutely. I think, um, you know, I have a slightly different take. So I think it's very important not to shame people for their brain reactions um, that are motivated by fear. So when people are afraid, when they're basically in fight flight mode, when they think their life is in danger, people will act irrationally. And I don't want to blame people for that because this is how our social brains work. But what I do want to blame elites uh, politicians, uh, people in the media, people in education, is if mm. they keep continuing to steer up that fear. Um, their role is to dissipate their fear, uh, this fear. Their role is to basically tell people, I understand if you see a Chinese person and you're afraid, but let's break this down. Let's see if it really makes sense rationally. And I think one very important role that Chinese abroad everywhere um, that they have and that they can take is that we humanize ourselves to the world. That's why we say, I am not a virus. We say, I am part of this society. You cannot uh, view me as this total foreign object. I am also German. I am also American. And I am Chinese. So I think that is really important. And I think it's difficult for the, Asian dia sorry, for the Chinese diaspora because culturally we're not really used to speaking up for ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're used to being quiet. We're used to sort of being grateful that we've been given our lives. And I say we need to make ourselves public. We need to humanize ourselves. We need to be courageous. Right. Um, and uh, we need to really take an equal seat at the table in these societies, not seeing ourselves as the perpetual foreign other who doesn't deserve to be treated as a full human being. Mm. Leah, you brought up a very great point. That is, how can we communicate with the rest of the world? That's a beautiful point because it's not just about the coronavirus and the xenophobia that we have to fight 
fight against. It is also on a daily basis how Chinese these days, as Professor Chambers earlier illustrated, have become very different from what people believe as it used to be. Uh, and how they, to communicate with the rest of the world? Is anger going to do the work? Is uh, fear and also self-protection only going to do the work? Or is going out there, talk to people with humor and not with finger pointing, that's going to do the work? I don't know. I'm asking you, both of you as experts. Leah, you go ahead. Well, I think there are two ways. I think you can humanize yourself in a very direct way, which is, you know, there's social media, there's talking to people. You can even speak to people saying, hey, are you afraid about the coronavirus? Ask me something. Ask me about how my family is affected. Mm -hmm. There's been a fantastic uh, one-man show in Italy, in Firenze, where basically a Chinese person put a mask on, put uh, blinds on over their eyes, yeah. and they said, I am not a virus in Italian. Please stop the prejudice. And after a while, people went up to him and hugged him. Him. It was very, very emotional. You know, can I hug a Chinese? Will I get infected? So that's one channel. But I also would want to say there's a political channel. Sometimes Asians abroad, we don't like to think politically in terms of rights, but we have rights. There are anti-discrimination uh, 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 places that you can complain to in your, uh, you know, various European countries. Um, there are associations that you can go to. Mm. Make yourself public. To me right now, although it's, it's a dark moment for the Chinese diaspora, to me it is a great opportunity because at no point in Germany, for decades, mm. we have not talked about the position of Chinese and Asians in German society. I think this is an opportunity and we can seize it and viruses will pass, but I think our voice, we can make that stronger and that will persist. This is a very interesting point. Also go to you, Professor Chambers, uh, about that. Is this the best time to communicate? Uh, how to communicate? What is the best way to communicate? It's not just about let me persuade you. It's about let's improve together. Let's get scientific information. Let's be able to face up to the disease together because it's going to be a global village, as we say. He global health is a global issue. So, Professor Chambers, your take here. Well, we can forget <coughs> American political leaders and American media. They are hardwired as a business model to be sensationalist. So it's going to have to be between scientific and medical communities and at a grassroots level. We have Chinese students uh, from China and Chinese American students at Georgetown and, uh, who have actually said, you know, our domestic flu is more of a threat to us than coronavirus is to anybody and have, and have talked about this. We have you know, epidemiological students um, from China and Chinese American who are showing this, uh, how devastating our domestic flu is and that has helped bridge some gaps and, 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 and dissipate some hysteria uh, about coronavirus. So it's going to have to be a grassroots kind of a thing and something where our, uh, our, our mutual medical and research um, institutions right. uh, bridge gaps because we cannot depend on, our, on the media, we cannot depend on politics. Right. Uh, before we go, I just want to show everybody this latest number so that we have an idea as to where the coronavirus uh, has already spread to, to what degree. The latest the flu surveillance from the U.S. Uh, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention reported that as of January, there were 15 million cases of flu and 8,200 deaths in the U.S. during this flu season. And for the coronavirus in China so far, there are more than 28,000 confirmed cases, a death toll of 550. And there are 12 reported cases in the U.S., five in Canada. And, of course, there are about 30 in Japan. As we speak, the number might be increasing, but we want to see the facts before we go and comment about it. We also want to see, no matter under what circumstances, we are together. We have to fight this together because this is global health. I want to thank both of you for taking your precious time helping us to understand the issue much clearer. Um, Li Ya Yu and... Christopher Chamber. Thank really you. appreciate it. Thank you. All the best. Be healthy. Thank you. Thank you. You're watching World Insights. Still to come. A digital shift in the global economy despite uncertainty. Executives from a Russian fund and Alibaba talk about the strategy coming right up.
Welcome back. You're still watching World Inside. I'm Ken Wei. Russia is facing a political transition. Russian President Vladimir Putin earlier appointed a new prime minister, Dmitry Medvedev, and his cabinet abruptly resigned after Mr. Putin proposed a number of constitutional changes. So what does the change of government mean for Russia investments? And after the phase one trade deal between China and the U.S. was signed, what does this tell Russian businessmen? What's the future of China-Russia cooperation earlier? On the sideline of World Economic Forum, I talked to Kirill Dmitriev, the CEO of Russian Direct Investment Fund. Let's listen in. We see each other everywhere. <laughs> it means you are having your investment around the world. But tell me more about your latest situation domestically first. A change of government, what does that mean? for investment and investment plans? Well, uh, we had previous governments that did lots of work to stabilize microeconomy of Russia. So our inflation is very low, our debt of government is very low, so we have a very good foundation. But now we have a government that I will call a breakthrough results-oriented government mm -hmm. that is tasked with really improving the growth of Russian economy. Mm -hmm. We need to have growth of more than 3%, not 2% we currently have. It's a government that is a chair by Prime Minister Mishustin, who has had great successes in his previous work as Minister of Tax Authority, mm -hmm. and he really brought lots of innovation and technology. About two percent to three percent—that's a huge jump, shall I suggest that way? Uh, how is that likely to be done? Well, uh, first of all, by really executing, we have our national project agenda, which is lots of projects and in infrastructure, and healthcare, and others. The government is spending quite a bit of money, but we want to make sure that this money is spent efficiently and those projects produce results that are good for the people and also some of the money we bring from our foreign partners from our domestic co-investors mm -hmm. so we are talking about a massive investment program that needs to be efficient but, but you know last time I checked with you also same thing have been said and illustrated that why should we believe this time is going to be different well first of all from last time we saw Russia has had great successes so our stock market is up 55 percent our foreign direct investment is more than doubled in the last year. We had massive inflow of foreign money into our debt. So we have really a turning point where West tried to isolate Russia from capital markets, tried to have Russia failed. But Russia did not fail. Through strong Russia, through partnership with China, we did very well. And now, as a new government, will really drive efficiency forward. Mm. Because, frankly, you know the difference between people who are results oriented and get right. results and people who just talk. Mm. We want to have lots of results oriented people in the government. And ourselves, you know, we invested five, more than 5 billion into top Russian projects last mm -hmm. year with very good positive uh, return of more than 15% uh, for our partners. Mm -hmm. So we continue to build great global partnership and China is one of our key partners. Talking about efficiency and China Russia, this is what I really want to ask you. People have been wondering about the efficiency of some of these uh, cooperation projects. They are great in content. However, what about moving them forward? To what extent can we see those projects shine, particularly to catch up with the uh, really good uh, political relationship between the two countries? Sure. I think we have a good foundation. For example, we have a great partnership with Alibaba. So we are jointly building Alibaba business in Russia and we'll announce soon additional payment system, joint venture with Alibaba and some of our partners. Mm -hmm. How big is that investment? Uh, so the total investment, uh, you know, is hundreds of millions of dollars just from our side. Uh, but the whole business of Alibaba is quite significant in Russia. And Russian side, us and our partners, we have control. Uh, but we need to do much more. Mm. And we want to have more of Chinese banks participating in the Russian economy. We believe that China can do much more in infrastructure because so far it invested a little bit in petrochemical project, a little bit in one of our uh, LNG uh, terminals. Uh -huh. But we want to have much more uh, Chinese investment. So our joint Russia-China fund facilitated $7.5 billion of joint investments. But we believe that this number can triple 
mm. and quadruple. And for that, Chinese business people need to pay more attention to the Russian market, needs to see the 55% growth in our market, and need to understand that now, with the new government, Russian growth agenda is going to be significant and successful. But exactly is the uncertainty that a lot of the business people are concerned about. I mean, Russia is a great potential market and great potential grower. However, at the same time, a lot of uncertainty. Change of government could be one of those. Yeah, but change of government is a great move because, frankly, uh, people wanted to have governments that's more focused on their needs yeah. and president is really implementing this change very quickly very successfully right. so Russia I think in the world where US is a bit unstable where Europe is having lots of difficulties where there is trade war between US and China little truth right now but we know that over the long term there will be lots of tension Russia we believe is a stable predictable place with lots of potential okay here's one thing that's going on in the world the Middle East now there have been so much latest development, to say the least. Russia certainly has a big role in the region, and probably increasingly so. So, Kirill, according to your plan, where is the Middle East in Russia's sovereign investment overseas? Yes, yeah, so first of all, Russia does play a huge geopolitical role. You know, we came to Syria, we stabilized Syria, and now in the conference on Libya, Russia really played a big role. We had a great partnership with Saudi Arabia to stabilize oil prices. The president just visited Saudi Arabia and UN in very historical visits. So Russia really wants Middle East to be stable. Unlike the US, who likes to change governments in lots of countries and then have terrible consequences like you see in Iraq, like you see in Libya, the whole uh, rise of ISIS came from toppling uh, the government in Iraq. Russia doesn't want to topple anybody. Mm -hmm. It wants to build partnerships and build prosperity. So what about so, the investment opportunities so and the plans? We have more than uh, five billion dollars invested in Russia by Saudi Arabia and UAE in the last three years mm -hmm. and we believe our partnership enables us to really bring lots of technology companies to the Middle East. Recently we invested in a major satellite image analysis company that is now going to play a big role in the Middle East. In uh, face recognition companies it's going to play a big role in the Middle East. So we have geopolitical partnerships in the Middle East, energy partnership and investment partnership mm. in the Middle East. Mm. China and uh, the United States just signed uh, the first phase one trade deal. You already also mentioned about that. But how do you see the relationship and the nature of relation between China and the United States from your perspective? Well, first of all, I think the signing of this interim deal is a good step for the world economy. It's very positive, but I think long term the tensions will persist because the U.S., frankly, wants to be the dominant player in the world. It's very difficult for U.S. to recognize that China can be the number one player in the world. So we believe the tensions will persist. Uh, meantime, Russia is quite interested to be a good partner of China. We have lots of great projects mm -hmm. uh, and again we believe that it's very important for uh, countries to find win-win scenarios. Yeah. Uh, it's not always win-lose uh, and we hope also that US and China find their long-term partnership going forward and this uh, solution we just had interim uh -huh. continues for a longer period of time. China and US economy combined together is only 40% of the global GDP. There are 60% others around the world. Russia certainly is part of that. So where do you see Russia in this China-US interesting time? Uh, Kirill, uh, what does that mean for your investment? Well, uh, Russia again is, uh, you know, uh, believes that trade needs to happen, investment needs to happen, so we are not really taking sides. I think it's very important for U.S. and China to figure out uh, their um, uh, way forward. Uh, I think we believe that free flow of trade free flow of investment, lack of protectionism right. is something that will move forward the world economy. And we hope that the U.S. would also uh, understand it that rather than just pressuring um, uh, other players, it's important to find win-win scenarios. Yeah. Uh, but frankly, President Trump's policies have been very successful so far. Uh, U.S. Uh, economy is doing the best ever. Uh, but I think for it to continue to do the best ever, it needs to have also a good uh, way forward with China. Now, 2020 is going to be a big year for a lot of countries, Russia also, for emerging economies as well. So what role do you think investment will be able to play to beat this bridge among the emerging economies and also uh, linking the economic development with the security in the region? Yeah, well, we believe emerging markets is a place to invest. 
uh, and right now is a good time for emerging markets because lots of countries up and coming. Brazil is doing much better. Uh, you know, overall emerging market showed 14% growth last year in their public markets. As I mentioned, Russia showed 55. Mm -hmm. So there is uh, an opportunity to invest more, but I think investors need to demand rules of transparency, rules of predictability from different emerging nations. Yes. And Russia provides this stability, and Russia provides this focus on good return for investments. Yeah. As I mentioned, we produce 10 returns in dollars for our partners ever since the fund uh, was founded. And I think at the end of the day, emerging markets can show good returns, mm -hmm. and Russia will continue to show good returns to investors. Always a pleasure seeing you Thank anywhere you so in the world. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having good me. Good to see you. Thank you. The digital economy has no doubt revolutionized the Chinese market. No wonder people are now working on introducing innovative development models to Africa. Alibaba is one of them. In 2019, Alibaba launched the Africa Entrepreneur Prize Initiative, trying to identify top entrepreneurs from across the continent, not only to reward them, but to inspire a whole new generation of potential game changers for Africa. Earlier, I sat down with Brian Wong, the Vice President of Global Initiatives at the Alibaba Group. He shares with me how new digital economy models are shaping the African market and the role of artificial intelligence and technology in a new era. Let's listen in. Brian Wang, what a pleasure to have you here in Davos. Thank you. You've been helping entrepreneurs, young ones coming from Africa to be able to nurture their market and going global. Tell me more about what Alibaba has been doing about this. Thank you, Wei. Um, you know, what you've described is a, a fairly new initiative that Alibaba has been pursuing really to share the lessons uh, from our experience of the last 20 years about the digital economy. Uh, we believe that there is a new development paradigm that's really emerged uh, thanks to uh, digital uh, technology, uh, e-commerce payments, um, mm -hmm. logistics, and we really want to share that with the rest of the world, particularly emerging markets. Yeah. And a lot of African young people actually are benefiting from the program. Tell me one or two of the case studies. Well, you know, we really, through our program called the E-Founders Fellowship in partnership with uh, the United Nations, we've developed a, a program where we bring um, the uh, ecosystem builders uh, or digital ecosystem builders from Africa uh, to Hangzhou to show them what uh, technology has done to create a more inclusive economy. What is the ecosystem builder? E ecosystem builder. Think of it as something like a, a, a e-marketplace, uh, maybe a payments platform using um, mobile uh, uh, phones, uh -huh. uh, even smart logistics. I see. So we've had probably um, in Africa close to 160 uh, of these uh, fellows, so to speak, who are building amazing businesses around agriculture-related initiatives, uh, payment platforms, uh, even delivery uh, services that utilize um, uh, mobile apps and uh, enable people to um, access services and products that whenever uh, possible. Uh -huh. um, one great example is uh, an individual who works with farmers and uh, farmers can actually get uh, market information using a, a, a feature phone by, the, by sharing data on their crop sort of planning uh, which is then combined with other uh, sort of more public data and, and, uh, and allows them to sort of predict the yield. Sounds cool. Which country is this? This is in Rwanda. And as a result of this data, uh, they're able to actually access microloans. Wow. And so if you think about a country that doesn't have the most sophisticated sort of network system, uh, they don't have the most sophisticated phones, yet they still have basic access to this information, mm -hmm. they, these entrepreneurs are able to provide a whole group of of individuals, this, in this case the rural area, to access uh, capital that would never have been possible. They already leapfrog in a way. Yes. Yeah, That's they, the they fascinating part of it, yes. isn't it? Tell me more about these examples. They're really fascinating. Well, um, another example we have is a, um, a young woman who has created a, uh, a shoe business and uh -huh. she uses recycled materials uh, to create these shoes, but she sells online. She not only sells successfully within Rwanda and in the region, but also globally. Uh, she was, her name is Kevin, and she was actually featured at, um, 
Jack's uh, recent Netrepreneur Awards uh, event in Ghana, which we held, the first of um, a whole series that we will hold for 10 years, uh, as a commitment to celebrate uh, African entrepreneurs' success. So th these are some of the examples. So what have you noticed about that entrepreneur spirit in these African young people? Well, you know, I think what uh, Jack and all of us recognize is this strong uh, drive and passion to create something that will really impact society. Um, these are entrepreneurs, yet at the same time, their mindset is really, how do I create something of value to help uh, the larger community? This isn't that different from this year's uh, Davos uh, theme, which is really stakeholders for cohesive and sustainable sort of you know, development. And uh, I know also there was an announcement about this Davos Manifesto 2020. Mm -hmm. It's not that different from what Alibaba has believed from, from day one, that we should create a business that actually creates value not only um, just in the market, but also for the larger community. Right. You know, I earlier got a chance to talk to Jack. Yes. Off the record, of course. Okay. But here's something she, he told me, which I'm very impressed. He said, uh, we are not trying to make any money out of any of the things that you just mentioned above. And he said, as long as we have the honor to participate, we are already blessed. That's what you told me. Maybe not an exact quote, but, but yeah. exactly what you have trying to say. But, you know, one of the things is stakeholder uh, interest this time discuss a lot at this year's World Economic Forum. But many wonder whether it's too little, too late, mm -hmm. or whether it's the old wine in a new bottle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's your take? Well, look, I, I don't think we really have much of a choice in today's world, given the situation with climate change, given uh, the, uh, the, the wealth and disparity that's growing and becoming even worse. What we need to do is figure out how to address these global issues as a global community. And so I think it's, it's time now that we had this new manifesto. It's been reflected in other groups, such as the Business Roundtable announcement in, in the United States, that businesses have a, a greater obligation not just to themselves and their shareholder value, but also to the larger community. And if we don't actually take action, I think that the consequences will be quite dire. But you know, on the other hand, technology is really one of the areas that businesses have to handle these days, vis-a-vis -vis society. Uh, artificial intelligence yes. is just one of those and it is transforming the labor market yes. and as we speak jobs might be lost as a result of the application of artificial intelligence yes. don't get me wrong yeah. I'm saying the technology is good yeah. let's make great advantage of it yeah. but the other thing is how to take care of the other side of the story now Alibaba is well known for pushing new technologies uh, regarding e-commerce and some of the others into the industry. Yes. Uh, what about that part? I mean, this is something close to what you're doing. What about this part? Well, look, I think job creation and uh, what happens to existing jobs is, is a valid concern. I think the rate of change that uh, takes place with this fourth industrial revolution will be faster than past ones. Mm -hmm. But I will say that to date, uh, since the first industrial revolution until now, there's always been concerns around this sort of phenomenon. Well, yeah, but it does not excuse us about right. not to have concern about the current one. So, so my, my point on this is that we, we need to be cognizant of this, and this is exactly why we're investing so heavily in capacity building and skills development in not only China, where we've done massive uh, programs to help those not only in the cities, but also in the rural areas, and even within the government, to help the government understand what is the impact of the digital economy on the larger society. So in the case of China, um, we've deployed... Um, tens of thousands of training programs, both in cities and rural areas. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we've seen the creation of about 54 million jobs that are the result of this digital ecosystem development. Mm -hmm. In rural areas in particular, 6.8 million jobs have been created and over a, oh, close to 100 billion U.S. dollars in turnover. Now think of the wealth creation that this provides for areas that had, did not have access to the mainstream economy. Mm -hmm. So how do you take that same model and apply it to the rest of the world? How do you engage um, farmers, those, you know, youth, women, even those who are disabled to become part of this digital economy? And I would, I would venture to say that you might lose some traditional jobs in the mm -hmm. process due to AI and, and robotics and whatnot, but you're going to create higher value jobs. And this technology should enable, and the training should enable these younger people and uh, even those who are yeah. presently working in the system yeah. to, to upscale and upskill their, their, their uh, abilities. You know, the global risk report put forward by the World Economic Forum this year has identified the 
big power rivalry as one of the biggest risks facing the world today, including for businesses. So how do you, from a global mechanism perspective you are doing with Alibaba, see this threat, this challenge? Well, I think this global uh, power rivalry is something which is inevitable in terms of people's concerns, but I think that I would hope that people can look beyond this uh, short term and think about what are the implications if we don't get along, uh, if the countries don't work together, um, and if we do not work together to develop technologies to address the bigger issues like climate change, like um, wealth inequality, like disease. So it's, it's time that we stop bickering over, over the small things and start focusing on the big things because as a humanity, we need to address this issue. Technology for good, that's always a topic, but do you think it is too far away still from us? What about the choices when it comes to making profits vis-a-vis -vis so-called moral issues? Uh, I don't think it's too soon. I think um, w it's really a mindset. Uh, do you believe it's possible? And then you start to act in the way that uh, you want it to become. Mm -hmm. And then the reality will, 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 will uh, come into existence. And so uh, I, I think, no, we should... Um, <laughs> When we talk about profits, it should not just be an economic conversation any longer. Our profits really relate to the, the, the bigger picture, which is exactly why I believe that this new manifesto makes all the sense in this day and age that we are living. Brian Wong from Global Initiative Alibaba. That's all we have for today. If you'd like to see our program, try to find us on YouTube, World Inside CGTN. And then also you could find us on Twitter and Facebook accounts. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching. Bye for now.